no le damos las herramientas políticas e ideológicas para luchar, para entender la realidad, nosotros no, no vamos a avanzar de esa visión limitada de los servicios de salud. Firmamos una carta de compromiso con la ministra de Salud. La firmamos en el momento que llegó, en el año 2014 ahora. Yo les digo una cosa, si no la hubiéramos firmado cuando llegó, ya no la hubiéramos firmado, porque ahora ya no nos quiere. Menos mal que rápido la firmamos. Y nos permite y nos habilita a que el Foro Nacional de Salud participe en las reuniones de las microredes de salud. Estamos al interior del sistema de salud. Nos permite hacer ejercicio de contraloría y nos permite estar en las evaluaciones que hace el Ministerio de Salud adentro, participando. Tenemos un plan estratégico que fortalece el trabajo de Contraloría como uno de sus ejes. Nosotros hacemos, tenemos nuestros instrumentos de Contraloría que hemos generado con la comunidad. Y ahí vemos calidad, calidez, desabastecimiento, cómo se atiende la salud sexual reproductiva. Y es el liderazgo en cada uno de los territorios, en las municipales, en las departamentales, que hacen ejercicios de contraloría social afuera de los establecimientos. Hacemos ejercicios de contraloría y no le avisamos al personal de salud. Porque si le avisamos, ellos hacen todo bien. Y eso pues eh, es lo que nos da los resultados más objetivos. Hemos eh, puesto buzones dentro de los establecimientos, dentro de los hospitales, que son unas cajas para que la gente ponga ahí su denuncia o su felicitación o lo que tenga que poner. Y es el liderazgo del foro el que tiene las llaves, no las tiene el personal de salud. Eso lo hemos peleado, nos ha costado. Pero nosotros tenemos el control de los buzones y las abrimos de manera conjunta para que haya transparencia y que no piensen que estamos inventando cosas, ¿verdad? Hemos hecho una campaña muy fuerte porque queremos que destituyan al viceministro de Servicios de Salud. Y a mí me dicen, la gente del partido, mira, eso se ve mal, afecta al gobierno. Más afecta al gobierno un funcionario mediocre de un gobierno progresista. No me importa. Yo voy a defender los intereses de la comunidad, no de ningún funcionario mediocre. Y por eso somos autónomos. Y aquí está. Peleamos porque eh, se, la derecha tiene mayoría en el Parlamento a partir de las elecciones de marzo. Ellos querían privatizar el agua al nomás que llegaron, tienen todos los votos. Hemos hecho una movilización tan fuerte que no les hemos permitido ni les vamos a permitir que privaticen el agua. No los hemos dejado, aunque son mayoría, no pueden, porque estamos en la calle defendiendo este derecho. Estamos en contra del asocio público-privado, porque el asocio público-privado favorece lo privado, y nos vuelve mercancía es nuestro derecho. Mucho menos la salud, mucho menos el agua, mucho menos la educación y los centros penales, que son lo que hoy quieren hacer en asocio público-privado y que hasta la OMS nos está sugiriendo que en los sistemas de salud promovamos políticas de asocio público-privado. No, no lo vamos a permitir y vamos a luchar contra eso. Luchamos por los derechos de la población LGTBI, por la diversidad, por la despenalización del aborto, porque lo tenemos absolutamente penalizado, por, la, por, la, por la, una vida libre de violencia para las mujeres. 
aquí dice que coma mierda la Coca-Cola. Translation. Eat shit Coca-Cola. The water is for the people. Y aquí estamos eh, trabajando con la Universidad Nacional para que haya un espacio libre de violencia para las mujeres y para la población de la diversidad sexual. El foro es parte del Consejo Consultivo Ciudadano de la Casa Presidencial y le hacemos contraloría al plan de gobierno. Porque aunque tengamos gobiernos progresistas, no debemos de permitir que tuerzan el camino que se vendan, que en aras de la gobernabilidad entreguen la soberanía. Hemos hecho acciones contra la corrupción en la Fiscalía, hemos denunciado las campañas desestabilizadoras de la oligarquía contra el gobierno, hemos... Eh, respaldado las leyes de cobro coactivo para que los ladrones de la gran empresa paguen los impuestos. Hemos trabajado por el incremento del salario mínimo y lo logramos con una campaña en contra de la empresa privada. Logramos el incremento del salario mínimo. Hemos hecho caravanas para irnos a parar al frente de las empresas y les ponemos el rótulo de lo que deben, ¿eh? Y nosotros decimos, yo pago, tú pagas, ellos evaden. Así no puede haber desarrollo. Y entonces, eh, aquí les ponemos el monto de lo que tienen que pagar y nos paramos enfrente de las empresas. Esta es la, las movilizaciones en contra de la privatización del agua. Y bueno, y estamos, participamos en, en 42 microredes del Ministerio de Salud y somos parte de los comités por el derecho a la salud de 19 hospitales. Nosotros decidimos al interior y vamos con el personal de salud viendo los problemas al, al, adentro de los hospitales. Y aquí es lo que hemos logrado, ¿verdad? Cambiar la concepción de salud de la gente. La gente no se puede quedar con los servicios. Y trascender a la determinación social. La comunidad comprende mejor que el personal de salud cuando hablamos de determinación social. Fortalecer y empoderar al liderazgo comunitario en la defensa de sus derechos. Nosotros ya no sabemos hasta dónde los comités comunitarios de repente yo los miro en la televisión y digo, ve, ahí están. Y se van en los diferentes territorios con diferentes problemas porque ya saben que tienen derechos y ahora estamos hasta con talleres de vocería para que aprendan a, me, a manejar mejor los medios. Fortalecer los espacios de participación dentro del Ministerio de Salud. La ministra no nos quiere, el viceministro de Servicios tampoco, pero no tienen valor de decirnos que nos salgamos, porque no pueden tampoco. Ahí vamos a estar, y si hay un cambio de gobierno, tampoco nos van a quitar. Ahí vamos a estar y vamos a defender nuestro espacio. Y a ocho años de existencia del Foro Nacional de Salud, juramentamos la mesa, también ahí está el doctor Espinosa. Aquí está. Juramentamos la mesa nacional y nuestro compromiso es seguir construyendo poder popular. Muchas gracias.
um, he's been involved in supporting the development of Aboriginal health policies at national level and also various aspects of community based care um, that are provided at community um, level. Um, John is going to present a case study of um, community controlled comprehensive primary health care services and the way in which data is being used um, to ensure accountability to the community. So John's going to speak in English. Thank you. Um, so to begin with, I'd just like to say that when we talk community control in Aboriginal Health in Australia, what we mean by that is an incorporated body that's been set up by the community, which elects an board, a board, an AGM of community members selected. That organisation is funded by government and employs all the staff. So the community control, that's what we mean by control. If there's a health community, if government run a health centre and there's a health community, that's a form of community participation. But when we get to control, that means the community actually run the organisation, they receive the funding, they employ all the staff, they set all the policies and employ the CEO. That's what we mean by community control. So I'm going to talk about one community control health service John Patterson is today talking about the fact that there's a network of community control health services at the state and territory level, and in the long territory that forms an organisation called AMSTAND, and there's 140 such services nationally, and that forms an organisation called NACHO. So the way we engage in policy and planning is through AMSTAND and NACHO, not so much at the local level. Um, so Congress began in 1973, and in fact, that's five years before the Almirada Declaration on Primary Health Care. So Aboriginal people in Australia basically set up a model of health care um, where they, and they, had, they really had to do it because Aboriginal people weren't recognised as citizens in Australia until 1967. So 1967 there's a referendum that gave them citizenship. But in Alice Springs where I work, the hospital wasn't desegregated until 1969. So there was a history of racism in the health system, and if Aboriginal people, mothers took their babies to the hospital, the hospital was the place that removed the children. So if the baby was a hard cast child, it was the hospital doctors who treat the child, but then they'd tell the native welfare branch and they'd know the name of the baby, where the baby lived, and so a mother would not take the baby to hospital unless the baby was about to die. And so you can see the history of lack of access to hospitals meant when Congress started in 73, the infant mortality rate was around 250,000 live births. Now it's less than 10. And when Congress started in 1973, the average life expectancy was 52 for men, it's now 63, and it's 54 for women, it's now 69. Now John Patterson made the point yesterday that that means the gap in the Northern Church is still 16 years. That's a big gap. And Aboriginal people's life expectancy in the Northern Church is actually worse than Palestine, it's worse than Bangladesh. And that's still unacceptable for a country as well as Australia. But when Congress first got going, another important feature of community child health services is they're used as a resource by the community for community action on both social determinants and clinical care. So from the very beginning, the first three things that Congress did was firstly, they set up a bank. And because Aboriginal people had been made citizens, but they didn't get access to welfare because they needed a bank account, they needed to be registered. So Congress set up a bank, registered people so they could get government transfer payments. They set up a tent, tent um, shelter, temporary shelter and tents. And this picture here, they organised the first rally for land rights. And in that period, no land had been handed back. Now, 50% of the land mass of the Northern Territory belongs to Aboriginal people. So there's been a lot of success in some of those big struggles. But in addition to that, in 1975, then they opened the clinic, first clinic. So they employed two doctors, Aboriginal health workers. So from the very beginning, I think the hallmark of comprehensive primary health care is this both and approach. It's not an either or. You need to both treat sick people and make them well with excellence in clinical care. And you need to address the underlying reasons why people are sick. At the poorest level, that's neoliberalism, but it's also all the social determinants. Congress has done that from the very beginning. It's always done both and never one or the other. Um, this is the structure of the organisation today. So there's a board, and the board has a number of 
subcommittee supports, I work for the community, it's an Aboriginal people, and I have subcommittees in governance, looking out of the clinics, research, male health, women's health, and finance risk and audit. Then there's four main divisions, the health services division, the public health division, the business service division, and human resources. And also Congress is the lead agency in a large research institution, which is controlled and the chairperson name is John Patterson, who's here today somewhere from AMSAT. But um, so there's a large research institution as well. So research is something that the community controlled sector also now controls. Um, and increasingly so. So it's a large organisation. At a glance, um, we service more than 15,000 Aboriginal people a year. There's 13 clinics, one or some in Alice Springs, and then in many remote communities, some as much as 450 kilometres out of Alice Springs in very remote areas. Um, we employ over 400 staff, half of those are Aboriginal people, and half aren't. Um, and we, we based, also we're very well funded, that's another thing I'd point out. I mean, some of the stories we're hearing from countries that are not as wealthy as Australia. So Congress is worth around $50 million a year, which means we get around $4,000 per person per year for primary health care. And as well as that, we have our own pharmacy and essential medicine, all, all the medicines that, that, that are on the Australian PBS system we supply, and that's worth another $4 million a year. So it's a large organisation, um, and it provides many services. So we have Maternal and Child Health Care, I'm going to talk about the Men's Family Partnership Program later. Maternity Care, Midwifery Lead Care, but with GPs and that. We have a lot of services for children, so we have um, healthy child health checks and have developmental assessments. We have two long, we have a long daycare centre, we have an early child development centre, I'm going to talk about that a bit later. We have a preschool readiness program, to try and make sure all Aboriginal children are ready for and get to preschool. Um, and a range of other child family support services. Um, youth services, we have a specific adolescent health service, um, and we have a range of services for adults and the old. We service the nursing homes. Um, we also provide a service into the dialysis. There's, there's 360 Aboriginal people on dialysis in Old Springs, which is very, so it's the highest rate of renal failure anywhere in the world in, in the community. So we provide services to that. And we run a whole heap of programs on top of that, social emotional well-being, sporting programs, social and cultural programs, tobacco, and a range of other things. So we're a large organisation. In terms of how we use data and how the community um, gets reporting, I'm just going to give you a bit of a snapshot of that. So the first way, we report to the board twice a year on key performance indicators, which we've developed ourselves. So this is a snapshot across five, six clinics. Horizontally, it's a separate clinic. And then there's a range, there's a range of some indicators. So one indicator, the first one, for example, is the proportion of women in the community who are pregnant who receive antenatal care in the first trimester. We look at the proportion of low birth weight babies. Babies born less than 2,500 um, grams. The coverage for childhood immunisation, the timeliness of immunisation, is underweight children, childhood anemia, care planning, blood pressure control, sugar control. There's a whole range of clinical indicators which we look at and we report on um, twice a year to the board. But increasingly, we've been able to use this thing called, there's a Microsoft program called Power BI. It's not expensive, it's about $500. And you can attach it to any IT system. And so we have a, we have a fully electronic health service, but the system we've got doesn't produce good data and good graphs. This thing, We've got 35 dashboards now, so all our staff, our key, key clinicians, our key managers have their own dashboards and they get data in real time on the program they're running. This one just looks at our population and you can see, you can click on the Gabbro Clinic or the Larapita Clinic and you get the clinic population for those clinic the age and breakdown. Um, and at the bottom you can see there's um, we can click on anemia, we can click on health checks, immunizations, all the key indicators we want are at the clinic level, um, and they're also in front of program managers, and they're updated every week. So they're able to use data um, very regularly to assess the impact of their program and what's happening. We also want to client satisfaction. So we do that every year through surveying. Um, we employ Aboriginal people, and there's about 12 language groups in Central Australia. The, the main language group is Aranda, and Eastern Aranda, Western Aranda, but there are many other language groups. Uh, 
well, being a whole range of others. So we, we survey about 600 of our clients face to face in language to see what satisfaction, what they think about me. And overall, people are very satisfied with the service. It is a free service, there's transport, free medicines, and there's, you know, we've got over 20 GPs, um, 45 nurses, it's a large service. Um, and, and we look from that survey, so that was going to look at what we did well and what we didn't do well. By and large, from the surveys, um, it's, it's pretty positive. In fact, 40% of people in terms of what we could do better next time said nothing. The main issue was waiting times. People were concerned about waiting times. But the things they said we did well, they thought the service was very um, um, inviting, that the care they got was good. So we do that every year to make sure we're hearing from our clients on what the service is doing. And we've got a lot better at complaints. So we've got complaints, we help people write complaints. Complaints can be added directly on our website. But if people want to complain, we help write complaints. And complaints have been going up because we've got better at helping people put in complaints. And we analyse complaints. We look at every complaint, we do root cause analysis and try and learn what we can for complaints. We also review all of our incidents, and we have, we have a really good electronic system for collecting incidents across the service. And we look at the major categories, so you can see there the most significant incidents were aggression towards staff and medication errors. And then we look into that, why are we making medication errors, and what can we do to stop those errors. Um, and then we consider ways to make our service better. The most significant change we've made in Congress in the last couple of years, we used to have one large clinic that service all those 10,000 people. The problem was that only 20% of people that came to that clinic saw the same practitioners each time they came. They kept seeing different people. And you can't get... One of the keys to quality care is continuity of care. And it's much more efficient. If you're seeing different people every time in your clinic, you've got to start, start again with the history. So what we did was we split the clinic. And we right now opened up Three new clinics, one in Saturday, one in Lower Penn, and one in Hillside. And we've got a maximum population of 2,000 people and a set number of staff of 2,000 people. So, having done that, that's made a big change in the quality of care and, and the community love it. They think that's better because when they come into those clinics, they see the same people. Um, and that's made a big improvement. So, to look at this, so what, just in two examples, chronic disease care plans, we made the change in 15, 16, and there's been a big increase in chronic disease care plans, there's been a big increase in health checks, we're getting better blood pressure control, better sugar control, and 70% of people that come to those decentralized clinics see the same practitioner every time. So that's been a significant improvement. Now, I just want to talk about two things that, in spite of the difficult social environment, the big picture issues like poverty and um, unemployment, low education. There are two things that Congress has worked on really from its inception that make a difference here and now. One is alcohol and one is early childhood. And I'll, I'll talk briefly about those two things as an example of programs that we've been engaged in. So many years ago in 1995, an Aboriginal leader has since passed on called a public meeting in Alice Springs and he wanted to close down all the alcohol outlets. Because alcohol is a major problem in the North Church for Aboriginal people. It's a, it's a major cause of domestic and family violence. It's, a major, it's the major cause of child neglect. It causes neurodevelopmental disorders. So not just ASD, but ADHD and a range of other things. So, and there's, we had excessive levels of supply. So from that public meeting that this Aboriginal leader called, we set up this group called the People's Alcohol Action Coalition. And Congress has been the lead agency in that, and that's a coalition of Aboriginal organisations, health professionals, churches, trade unions, it's been going since 1995, and we've been trying to turn the tap down. We've been trying to regulate the alcohol supply system, particularly around price, because price is the most important determinant of consumption. Um, and we've had some success, so that looks at per capita alcohol consumption over time across the Northern Territory, and it's declining. And it's really implied because we've been able to remove cheap grog from the market. And if I show you one example, in Alice Springs, this, this slide shows a, over time, over a 10 year period, that's looking at the wholesale price of alcohol. So you can see here, in 2006, there's a big jump, 25 cent increase in the 
minimum in the wholesale price, which is achieved by doubling the minimum price of alcohol. And that was achieved by removing cheap cast wine from the market. What happened, that led to a 20% reduction in consumption of alcohol. It led to a massive shift to beer. So this is when it happened here. Blue's beer. So there's a 70% shift to beer. Beer is expensive. Beer costs all the 30 cent a drink. So that's why there was a big decline in consumption of pure alcohol. And then there was a big decline in hospital emissions, alcohol related hospital emissions. So this one's looking at hospital emissions for average women for assault, and there are about 120 less emissions a year from assault. So we've, other work suggests that alcohol is not the only cause of domestic violence, it's, a, it's one cause, but if people weren't drunk, 50% of domestic violence would go away. So that's a major impact. Um, so finally, after many years this year, the Northern Church on the 1st of October introduced a minimum price on alcohol. The problem with banning products, every time we did these restrictions over many years, we banned products. The liquor industry would come up with a new product that wasn't banned, it was cheap, like two liter pork, or clean skin wine, wine in bottles, with no label on it. And it ends up, they keep coming up with products that sell at 25 cents a standard drink, which is cheaper than water. But now, on the 1st of October, the government's enacted legislation, so they're no longer allowed to sell alcohol less than a dollar thirty standard drink. So that gets rid of all the cheap grog from the whole of the Northern Territory, and we think that's going to have a major impact on alcohol. Finally, I just want to briefly talk about early childhood. Wilkinson in his book on inequalities in health.
আমি তাকে সবচেয়ে খুঁজতেছি বুঝি কিন্তু যা বলা দরকার সেটা আর বলতে পারি